You're listening to Managing Leadership Anxiety, Yours and Theirs, a show that discusses internal and relational anxiety, how it blocks effective leadership, and how we can move through it to a greater health. And now your host, Steve Cuss. All right. Hey, we are on the Managing Leadership Anxiety podcast, Family Edition. Mrs. Cuss is with us. Hello. And so are all the siblings. So let's introduce ourselves, starting with Lisa. All right. My name is Lisa. And what do you Oh, how old you are, how often (laughs) Pakistani men hit on you, things like that. So I'm 45 years old. Um, I have to say I'm probably in my most favorite season of life with this family, with the age of the kids, conversations we get to have, and um, yeah. Bryson, what do you think the chances are mom's going to cry on this podcast? Uh, Yikes. uh, I'll I'll give her 45. 45%. 45%. Percent. It's yeah. pretty yeah. low considering. So tell us about yourself, how old you are, um, what order in the family you were born? Yeah, I'm, I'm number one. I am the first <laughs> son to pop out. And uh, <laughs> actually, just the first, first child, really. Uh, it was a race. <laughs> it was a race. Um, though I did have a head start. Uh, my name is Bryson. I, uh, I'm 18. I'm going to college this fall. Mm-hmm. And. That's what may make mom cry throughout the podcast. It's but, possible if we talk about it. Is yeah. that our goal? The other, well, mm, it's no. often our goal. The other interesting little factoid is you're not always a morning guy. No. You, you like to ease in in the morning, and mom offered to help wake you up this morning. With some tickles. <laughs> At 18, yes. It yes, was. yeah. Yeah, and you were feeling that maybe you were a bit old for that. Yeah, well, I mean, the thing about tickling is the reason it sucks is because it feels like you're being attacked and so that's and then you then picked up an ice cube from the freezer (laughs) threw it at me it's true love it is again simulating the attack i'm seeing the source of anxiety in our family already (laughs) yeah we'll actually get to acute versus chronic anxiety in this episode so we'll be back to that um kaylee what's your birth order well hello i'm kaylee and i'm last or third yeah i lost the race Nice. And how old are you? I'm 12. Okay. Then our uh, middle spawn. Um, I'm Andrew. Um, I'm 15. I was the second in the race, um, but second's just the first loser, so it's a little upsetting anyway. Um, and I'm going to be a sophomore. And if I could be any candy bar, then... Big hunk. What? Big hunk. <laughs> You'd be big oh, hunk. Why? Wait, would you be big hunk, or are you saying Andrew would be big hunk? I think Andrew should say. I thought he was going to say big hunk. You know, like so the, new, the new guy bar. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would probably um, be a Milky Way because they're cool. Are you able to talk without smiling? Like in general. <laughs> okay. Wait, like no. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> All right. So what we thought would be fun on the show is not just to get our kids on. We, we really enjoy our kids, but also to see what it's like for teenagers and preteens, of whom Kaylee is one, um, how anxiety shows up in teens and in school life and social life and stuff, stuff like that. So why don't we begin? We'll see what happens here. Uh, anyone can play. How do you know when you're anxious? Um. <clears throat> I know when I'm anxious because I tend to stress out about everything, including the tiny things. Like if I lost my phone and it's just sitting on the couch, I tend to stress out a lot if I'm overall anxious. So you're saying like that you're not just anxious about the one thing like finding your phone. It feels like you're being piled up on. Yeah. Can you say more about that? Can you give us a kind of an example of what it feels like for you? It kind of just feels like I need to fix all of the things that's going wrong in my life. And then when something else goes wrong, it just seems like an even bigger problem that I have to fix, and it piles on on me, and it feels like a lot of weight. feels like it's un- unmanageable. Yeah. yeah. That's a good example. Mm. Uh, for me, uh, I kind of don't really act like my normal self when I'm just generally anxious, and uh, I think it often comes out in anger, um, which I do try to keep to a minimum, but... Sometimes it does, it is expressed. Uh, I don't know, I think when I'm at that point, then I really notice like about myself, 
I am anxious right now. Yeah, one of the things I think that's interesting about you that other people have told you as well is you're a very even-keeled fellow. So it feels like sometimes you know you're anxious before anyone else does. Is that true? Probably. Yeah. I mean, that kind of conflicts with me also uh, sometimes not really being in great touch with my emotions. Okay. Uh, where it may take me a while to figure out how I actually feel about something. But, it, yeah, I, I would say that I most of the time I know I'm anxious before others do. Yeah, but then you're also saying that sometimes you don't know you're anxious until you're, like, really anxious. Yeah, yeah. Or I don't realize that it's really a big issue until I'm really anxious. Oh, yeah. It's kind of a threshold almost. But you, but you tend to just hold it and do it all and figure all that out just on your own? Most of the time, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Do you guys think you know when Bryson's anxious? Yeah. yeah. How do you know, Andrew? Um, well, you can kind of tell he's just kind of flustered and like he sometimes will just go on and on about things that like maybe he doesn't usually go on and on about or like... Um, he kind of has a voice where he's like, so this is what happened and this is what happened and this is what happened. And he just, it's kind of just, it's, it's different because he just kind of sounds more flustered and like more frustrated than he normally is. And he's not normally frustrated, but like you can just kind of tell like whether it's with the tone of voice or how he's talking, just that he's flustered. Yeah. yeah, like you sliced open a open a flower bag, and it's just yeah, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, this actually happened? No, no, no. Like if he if he were to ask me a question about something I'm anxious about, mm. I'm a uh, fifty pound flower bag. Uh huh. And so he's just taking a knife with that question, and slicing it open, and then everything just pours out. Is that how you feel? Yeah, I feel like that's how I function. I've never heard that before. That Where did, how did you come up with that? I before? came up with it just now. Wow. Yeah. Because the flower bag makes a big old mess and takes forever to clean up. Yeah. And well, actually, I didn't even think about that aspect. But for me, it was more like you if you ask me one aspect of it, then I'm basically going to tell you all of it. That really, it's not really how I used to be, but mm-hmm. that is how I am. Kind now. of floods out. Yep. yep. I like that. Mm-hmm. How about you, Andrew? I would say I can kind of tell that I'm anxious when. Um, I start to like overthink literally everything and I find the worst case scenario and not just a thing that started my anxiety, but maybe other things that I could possibly, um, quote unquote, need to be anxious about when I really don't. And, um, I feel like that kind of just brings me down and it makes me tired because it wears me out because I'm just thinking about too many things that I don't need to be thinking about where maybe um, they're going to be okay or they almost always are going to be okay. Um, And I just get tired and it kind of makes me pretty short-fused. So, like, I get pretty annoyed easily when I'm anxious because I'm I'm just constantly thinking and it's wearing me out. Yeah, it's almost like a low boil. It doesn't take much to get you to boil over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's definitely how. Um, I feel like the same kind of way where everything's piled up on me and I just get flustered about things that I usually aren't, am not flustered about. Yeah. And how can you tell truly when Andrew's anxious? You get annoyed over really easy things. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Like, let's see. Maybe if a washcloth is hanging on his towel in the bathroom. (laughs) Usually, <laughs> if he's extra anxious, he's like, Kaylee, you need to get the washcloth off the towel. Yeah. Or if he's not, it's just kind of a, you know, please get it off. And then, yeah. Um, I would just like to say that you your, wa- need to your, your washcloth right? is constantly on my towel. I don't so mean I would not say, I know you don't mean to, but I would like to say that I do not think that is a. That is an amazing example of how you can tell when I'm anxious because it is a it is a recurring pattern where I have to I have to it is starting to cause me a lot of anxiety. I think it's a good example though because the washcloth is always on the towel, but sometimes your reaction to it is way more than the crime of a washcloth being on a towel. How about that? That that does work. 
Yeah. I just don't like to come out of the shower with a wet towel. For sure. That has been used to clean our toilet. Okay. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good. Mrs. Cuffs. As I recover from that one. Um, yeah, I think for me, I notice anxiety anymore when I cannot relate to people that are close to me. So I notice that... That's us. <laughs> no, that's us. No, I notice that in the morning, like if I wake up anxious about the day or anxious about something and conversation is happening, it's like I hear it, but I'm so in my thoughts that I can't join it. Um, and then I, I've noticed also that then that creates distance or I go then to the to-do, you know, of what needs to get done um, just to help me. <laughs> and I know we've all experienced that. I'm going to share a secret about mom that I don't know that we've ever talked about. So we'll see how this goes. But one of my favorite things about mom is when we wake up in the morning and she's anxious, you never know the first thing she wants to talk about. Like as I'm waking up, I need two coffees to get my mind going in a shower <laughs> And mom wants to solve a problem like, I don't know, when are we going to paint the baseboards or just something. Yes, huge. Yeah, world hunger. Or world hunger, yes. But it's usually a very particular thing that you want to talk about right away. Yes, right. It's quite endearing. It's very fun. I notice when mom's anxious, her mood completely just changes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you, keep and you keep telling me my face changes. Mm -hmm. I notice, yeah. yeah, sometimes when you're like looking at a text and you're anxious, your face just says it all. Your jaw tightens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your jaw tightens and your jaw eyebrows tightens. are kind of like and just furrowed. Yeah, mom doesn't really have a poker face. No. Yeah. So what about me? I should be on the hot seat. How do you guys know when I'm anxious? Mm. Well, how do you know when you're anxious? Yeah. I know when I'm anxious, mostly when my mind is racing. A couple of you guys have mentioned. I, I believe the lie that I can worry my way to peace. So I find myself spinning and spinning. So last night, Andrew and I were driving home and he was chatting and it made me think of something that made me mad that had nothing to do with Andrew. It was, I just went off on this thing and it was a thing at church. And Andrew's like, are you okay? And I couldn't say to him, oh yeah, let me tell you the thing that's made me mad right now. <laughs> do you remember that? Yeah, because I could tell like, I'm literally talking to him. It was a pretty happy topic too and he just looks, <laughs> he just has a frown on his face and starts sh like shaking his head. I'm like, dad, dad, are you okay? Yeah, I, he's, I was he's gone. Like, he's like, yeah, I'm fine. Um, but I can also notice kind of similar to that is sometimes I'll be talking to you about things and you're just completely like not listening I'll because go, yeah. like, and you don't, I don't think you know that you're not listening cause you're not trying to ignore me, but like I'll be talking to you and I'll say something and I'll stop talking and you're still just looking right into your computer. Like you're like, mm -hmm. I'm like, uh, dad. And you're like, huh? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's mm -hmm. kind of, um, it seems like you're like, that the racing in your mind is kind of draining you out and it's hard to listen when you have a lot of other things to think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's true. Do you want to add to that, Kaylee? Oh, no, he said it pretty much. Whenever you're like talking to you when you're anxious, you kind of just, you're like silent for a minute and then you're like, what? And then you go off again and you're just in a whole different place. It's not like rude or anything, but you can tell you're anxious. Well, I think it could be rude sometimes. Mm, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Unintentionally rude. Yes, it's not like you're trying. I'm to not trying, trying to blow you off. Yeah. I'm accidentally blowing you off. Yeah. <laughs> Usually you're not as like playful, and uh, yeah. you're, it seems like you're not really enjoying uh, what's going on in the moment as much as you usually would. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you kind of go silent. And you're not cracking any jokes. You usually yeah. crack a joke a car ride. And you know one joke per car ride? Yes. Only one. That's limiting. Yeah, yeah I, feel, I, feel, I feel constricted. And anxious. I feel and edited you're, right well, now. Well, when you're anxious, Are you, you just... anxious? No, I don't think I'm anxious right now. What I notice is that your environment bothers you. If you're anxious and it's feeling pretty weighty, then you're finding what's wrong with the environment and maybe who's not doing their job. Um, and typically, it's more fun or reminders, but when you're anxious, the little things seem really big. It's true, yeah. Yeah. So one of the things I have every guest answer on the podcast is if they can name where anxiety starts for them. So we've kind of hinted at it, but why don't we go around? It's either a spinning mind, a racing heart, 
or a tightening gut. And a tightening gut could be feeling sick or butterflies. Sometimes it's all three, but do anyone want to say where you think it starts for you? Spinning mind, racing heart, or a tightening gut? Um, so for mine, it mainly starts with the spinning mind, but if I'm really anxious, then it goes to all three. Um, so like <clears throat> if I'll, like, for example, I w have been working at a camp this summer and, um, it was a phone call interview and I saw a phone call from the Woodland Park area and first my mind started spinning and then I felt my heart like really thumping and then like my stomach like clenched and it's just cause I was like nervous cause I didn't know how to, I've never really done an interview before. So I didn't know like what questions were usually asked or, um, and I just, what happened is I knew I needed an interview, but I totally forgot that I planned it for that Saturday morning. Um, so I like wasn't prepared for it at all. And I was just like, wait, oh, it's coming. So I just, I guess that would be a good example, but mainly it's just a spinning mind. What was the order of that for you? Did you say thumping heart yeah, first? Yeah, my heart started thumping first, and then my stomach clenched. And then while I was on the phone call, I couldn't quite think of how to answer the questions as, mm -hmm. like, to the best of my ability because of, like, everything that was going through my head. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> well, mine usually starts with a spinning mind also because I just think about all the things that are going wrong and everything intensifies for me. So, for example, I do gymnastics, and so at competitions, right before I go up to do a routine or do something in front of the judges, it starts with a spinning mind, oh, what if I mess up, oh, what if I do this wrong, and then all the of a sudden, ifs. butterflies end up in my stomach, and then my heart's thumping a lot, and when I go, I'm totally fine. Yeah. But it starts in your mind as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, well, with this kind of situation that Andrew brought up, I feel like for me it would more start in my heart because if I see, you know, a phone call which I totally forgot about and I need to be prepared for, then yeah, my heart's going to be racing. Uh, I think in general, if it's like, if it's anxiety that's going to last for a few days or so, then it definitely starts in my mind and it kind of builds in my mind. I think the last thing to happen for me is really just the heart in more intense moments. And then I just, in general, have a very tight gut when my anxiety is really high. Mm. Um, yeah, which so I haven't. It starts different places depending on the situation. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. And so I really haven't had that tight of a gut for anxiety not much until recently. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Like I feel like I really haven't been this anxious before. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you're becoming more aware of it. You always used to think, oh, I'm not really an anxious person, and now you're like, oh, actually, I carry quite a bit of anxiety. Well, yeah, sure, and I think it's also that, I mean, I haven't really carried that enough anxiety to realize that either. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think I've never carried more anxiety than I have this summer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah tough yeah. summer. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. Do you think then that your heart or your gut, when you feel it physically, then that makes you realize how much your mind is spinning? Um, I do often catch myself kind of dwindling in my mind. Mm -hmm. Dwindling, is that the right word? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, just kind of going in a downward, downward anxiety spiral. Right. Uh, yeah, often though, my gut is a good indicator. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Something's going on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I... I think I, I think anxiety comes in layers and I would have earlier said that it's the tightening gut that I just feel this in the pit of my stomach and that's what makes me notice. I think the more I become aware, I realize that it starts in my mind and sometimes if I can catch it with my mind spiraling and name it, um, then I can avoid the tightening gut. However, if there's, if I'm bombarded with an experience of feeling anxious, then it is definitely my gut before my mind. Um, <clears throat> for me, to relate to Bryson also, it sort of um, depends on kind of what anxiety, whether it's really a real, like if someone is 
if you're in danger and it's you have to be anxious, it's definitely my gut. But if it's something like drama at school or gymnastics or something, it's definitely a spinning mind. Mm. So mom mentioned something interesting is that if you can name it, it, it kind of stops it from spinning. And then the other interesting thing is I've noticed like with you, Bryson, like you definitely use the piano to de-escalate anxiety or stress. Like I remember when you were really working hard on homework before you graduated, you had tons of homework and it was intense homework and you'd figure out when to go take a break and you play piano. I think every one of us have things that we go to to intervene with our anxiety, does that make sense? So rather than just sitting and spinning. So I'd love to start with you and then just hear from the rest of us. What do we do when we notice ourselves going down that like spiral? What do we do to intervene to give us some life? Um, I feel like music in general is just relaxing for me. And so um, piano is my main instrument. So, I mean, we have a piano in the room. So I'm like, I'm just going there and shut the door and play whatever I want to play. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, how do I notice that? I'm not entirely sure, but I think when I feel overwhelmed, I just want to go do something sometimes that feels mindless. Mm -hmm. Like, I wouldn't, if I'm in the middle of heaps of homework, I wouldn't be able to go to the piano and just start composing. It would it'd have to be something that I already know how to play, uh -huh. like something that feels more mindless than, uh, than homework. Yeah, I, I really like the example because you're not trying to worry your way out of it. You're like right. using some whole other experience to invade your anxiety. That's how I would say it. It, al it almost feels like a distraction too. Um, it, and it does, I do come back feeling a little bit more uh, in control of myself uh, for homework, for example. But, you know, I mean, when I'm really anxious about ho homework, uh, it's kind of where I get into a procrastinator's loop, uh -huh. and I just am at the piano, and then I come back for like five minutes, and I'm like, eh, <laughs> and I go back to the piano. Or, you know, just sitting, scrolling through Instagram on my phone. Um, I think as anxiety gets overwhelming for me, I just shut down instead of trying to look at the problem and solve it. If you, if you don't intervene, you tend to like numb out or, yeah, yeah. yeah. I like that you, you bring up the distraction piece. Um, it seems like for you, music and piano is something that both um, helps you release some of the anxiety, but it also helps fuel you. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that. incredible to have an activity that you can do that helps de-escalate it and get it yeah. out and also fill you, whereas watching TV can numb it or distract you, but won't necessarily fill. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, w one of the questions I ask the guests is, what is something that gives you life and makes you feel alive? Mm -hmm. So that, that would yeah, be what? I think that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I have seen, like, the whole Instagram distraction thing with Bryson, like, sometimes I'll just be in a room, and I'll just see a phone fly across the room because he's like, I don't need it. <laughs> just, it just throws it right across the room. I was like, um, so yeah, I kind of thought that was funny one time. He was just doing homework. Well, kind of doing air homework. Air quote homework. Yeah, yeah. air yeah. quote homework. Yeah. Um, and he's just on his phone. He's like, wait, what am I doing? He just throws it across the room and just starts doing homework. And I found that kind of impressive. Yeah. Yes. Also, this podcast is brought to us by uh, strong iPhone covers that protect iPhones from getting aerial. Yeah, true. <laughs> yes. well, he, always throw, he always, wait, always wait. throws it onto carpet. Oh, it's that's, carpet. thank you it's for that. High, high pile, high <laughs> shag carpet. Usually he, usually he aims for the couch. Sure. I'll be sitting actually here at the dining room table and then I'll just look over at the blue couch and... You know, it's an ultimate frisbee competition. <laughs> right. Yes. right. In which the couch wins. Andrew, what's something life-giving for you? Um, so I would say whenever I'm anxious about something, um, I go to either you guys to talk about it or some of my really close friends just kind of like to talk a lot, talk about it and like step-by-step de-escalate what I'm anxious about. Um, and sometimes I talk to the wrong people, which makes me even more anxious. Like that has definitely happened. But um, um, I've kind of learned who is like the safest to talk to and who will kind of help me out. That's fascinating. Um, 
Um, but also sometimes I'll just go play basketball outside just to kind of exercise my mind instead mm -hmm. of making it spin. Yeah. For you, Andrew, is it helpful? Because you, I, I noticed the difference. Like Bryson says, it takes a while, right, to tell somebody. And Andrew, you need to get it out right away. Is it just the getting it out that can help you? Yeah, just like saying it out loud. Because sometimes I'll make myself the enemy in my anxiety. And I'll make myself the bad guy and see like so what have I done wrong to make this situation happen and then when I say it out loud I'm like I haven't done anything wrong and um I'm just my mind's thinking about things it should and, and just goes to a darker place and um it just helps me regain control of what's true and what's right when I am able to say it out loud or even text it out to someone or on the phone with someone. Um, it just kind of helps to uh, just kind of say it and then hear it myself saying, huh, well, how, like, how is that, tr like, true or what have I done to maybe make the situation worse? Yeah, what are you seeing there, Lisa? Well, I an external processor too, right? Like figuring out, look, it sounds like Andrew, our experience is that you need other people, and not need, but it just helps you to have other people to talk to, to make sense and get, kind of reframe the situation. Um, and then versus another person who might need to figure out, like I'm more, I often need to internally process to figure out what it is I even wanna say and then I need to dump it for somebody else so they can help me make sense of it. Yeah, so you're another one where basketball is a indirect solution. Right? For Bryson, if he's worried, playing piano is an indirect. Basketball is a physical option, but it's also a, I don't know, it's not attacking the problem. I think a lot of people, when they get anxious, they really do, their next solution is just try harder. So if you're worried, then just worry more. But I think these are really helpful to name things that are sideways or you call them distractions, B. Hmm. Yeah. Well, and I've noticed even when I'm playing, like just like playing normally, I think the most clear when I'm like playing basketball, like I think about things kind of more correctly than um, I normally would. Um, and I don't know if it's just that I'm kind of exercising my body or just kind of giving my brain to rest from working um like super hard i guess it probably has to make my body move but you know that's nothing um so i think it just helps to like do something that you can do where you're not only thinking about the problem where you can also be thinking about other things and i think that kind of helps dissolve the anxiety for me yeah kaylee do you have a a place or a, or a thing you do that helps you when you're feeling anxious? Um, <clears throat> well, a lot of times I just go straight to my passions. So a lot of times the tramp is kind of a, I love doing like tricks on it and stuff. And that just kind of clears my mind and gets me thinking about things exciting coming up. Like, oh my gosh, practice is Tuesday. So like, you're fine, just get anxiety off your mind and stuff. Sometimes I'll go to the piano and play one of my favorite songs. Um, and sometimes I just need to lay down and get my mind around what's going on. So I do that a lot before I go to my passions. Because um, anxiety feels really heavy on me usually. And it makes everything around me feel intense. And so um, sometimes like if I am singing and it just doesn't go right I'll just get anxious about that and so sometimes I don't like to go to my passions because um, I don't want to get more anxious about things so generally I just kind of lay down and like reframe kind of yeah when you guys were super young before you were born Kaylee mom and I when we lived in Las Vegas where Andrew was born um, I did a lot of work with people in domestic violence relationships I did a lot of people would come in trying to get help getting out of domestic violence. It was super intense. And I've come to the conclusion that anxiety acts like a abusive relationship and that we put up with it way too long. We don't realize that we can escape and get out. And that was my experience with people trapped in 
domestic violence is they didn't, it was so hard for them to see a way out. You, that's what it reminded me of when you said that. Like anxiety always gives us, I think, bad news. Um, yeah, so that was my reaction to that. Yeah. yeah, for sure. How about you, Mom? Well, I think going along with what you're saying, I remember when you had Laura Turner on your podcast and she talked about um, even treating anxiety like a pet, right? Yeah, and that's such a powerful visual for me is when we notice we're in, Kaylee, I can relate when anxiety gets big and just everything feels doomed and it's hard to get out of it and you just feel this heaviness. Then you realize, you know what? I think anxiety is taking me for a walk right now. <laughs> and what do I need to do so that I can put anxiety on the leash and go take it for a walk? Um, and so for me, it depends on how much time I have, um, but walking or jogging either with my, just by myself or with a dear friend um, it's a combination of being in nature and moving. I think there's something about moving that, that helps me work it out and take it for a walk instead of it taking me. Um, if I don't have much time, if I can just clean something <laughs> or straighten something that makes me feel like I'm in control of just something, even if it's small, um, that's another way for me of having my, of, of taking it for a walk and just changing the power in it. Yeah. Usually after I kind of reframe, I try and talk to the person who may cause me anxiety or something that did cause me anxiety and try and fix it. Yeah. You're mentioning reframe. That's actually a technical term. Can you tell us what it means? when you? What do you mean by reframing? Sort of like thinking about your anxiety and saying you like reframing, meaning like changing how you think about it. Sort of. So, like, at first you may think about it as something that you can never overcome. If you reframe it, it sort of means that you need to change your thoughts to it's going to be okay, like you're going to get over anxiety. That's really good. Yeah, I think what you're describing is you're um, testing your assumptions. You're saying, yeah. is this really true? Is this really the way it is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What am I believing yeah. in this that's not true? I'm trying not to, like, I'd probably say I'm the same way with that is I think with you, I have the habit sometimes where I'll say, oh, if, well, if I, eventually I'll worry so much that I'll stop worrying or that it'll resolve itself. Um, but even sometimes with, like, small things that I'm anxious with, I just tell myself how, like, kind of dumb that sounds or, like, like what makes you think this, and then I kind of just calm myself down. Um, and I guess that would probably be, like, me reframing the situation. So a question popped into my head. I've never asked this of guests, and um, it's interesting. I'm actually on the hunt for fresh questions for season three because this is our last episode of season two. But um, as, as everyone was talking, it occurred to me, I wonder if every one of us has a place or an activity where we never feel anxious. So like I just went fly fishing yesterday. I was going to go down and pick up Andrew from camp, and there's a great fly fishing spot. And it used to be that when I fly fished, I got anxious because I wasn't very good at it and I felt stupid when I couldn't catch a fish. So that didn't work. But in the last couple of years, somehow I've done some work with God on that and just being in the water, whether I catch or not, I just can't, I just don't worry. Um, and often I find myself too, when I'm playing guitar, it's really hard for me to be worried when I'm playing guitar, when I'm on a date with mom, for example. So pound that. Um, yeah, anything, a, a place, of like a physical place or an activity where you're like, yeah, I'm never, I'm always relaxed. Every time I'm in like a body of water, I love swimming, I love the ocean, I love everything like that. So when I'm anxious, I try and think about like how peaceful it was at the beach when we went to the beach that one day. And like, um, I love to... Like how you said, just being in water, so peaceful. I really love, because I feel like nothing can go wrong. 
when I'm there. But it sounds it sounds weird. Which athletes are but <laughs> yes, your fearlessness. Sometimes, like even if we're just at the pool, sometimes I just put put my feet in the water, just kind of think. Um, yeah, I mean, so for me, I don't really have a place, but piano and uh, soccer as well. Playing uh, soccer. Yes, yeah. uh, especially if it's with um, some of the people I've been playing with for the past four years. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. uh, that was a great group of people. And even just that entire fall season was like a really, felt like an elevated season of Magical. life for me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's and so, interesting because you've been going to all these kick arounds even though you've graduated. Yeah. And that's part of the you just really enjoy that. I do. People. Yeah. Well, and I do it when I can because most of the time work gets in the way. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Work, work is a drag. Work is dumb. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's really interesting. One of the things that's a huge source of joy in life for you is people with a common cause. Yeah. When I'm around people, who I can relate to or who I'm similar to and who I enjoy talking to, then it's easier to kind of figure out what I need or just not be anxious because I have nothing to be anxious about and they have nothing to be anxious about and, like, I can be my true self and, um, like, the people at camp are kind of people that I feel like I can always be that way around. Whenever yeah. you come back from that, you come back with another understanding of of who you are. Like I love that you mentioned, you can be your true self. Yeah. Um, and that's been fun yeah. to see and figure out how to integrate. So um, the other thing we try to do on this show is be helpful to listeners so that they can, like, I think this conversation is helpful, but we also sometimes get into some technical terms or some tools. Um, so rather than us all feeling like we have to say, if, if anyone wants to, let's talk about a couple of things. Let's talk about the difference between acute anxiety and chronic anxiety. Do you want to take that one, Kaylee? Yes, please. Go ahead. Okay, so... Um, acute anxiety is where the danger is real and there's an actual threat and it probably won't last very long, but there is a threat out there that could endanger you. Yeah, give us an example. So like if you're home alone and someone is breaking into your house, that's definitely a threat. So can, let me just jump in. So it's really important that people understand that on this podcast, we're not talking about acute anxiety. We're not. No. We're not telling people how to overcome it because it's normal. So what's chronic anxiety? Chronic anxiety is not a threat, but it's something that feels so like a threat. Like if you're having friendship problems or relationship problems, it feels like a threat. And it may last a long time, but it's not going to hurt you. And what we say on the show is your body doesn't know the difference. Yeah. So your body reacts to chronic anxiety the same as it reacts to acute anxiety. And that's what makes us stressed and all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. So this whole show is really about managing chronic anxiety. Uh, we've mentioned one of the things we, we have talked about, but we haven't used the name is triangulation. People have given examples of it. Does anyone want to tell us what triangulation is? Uh, yeah. So triangulation is uh, if there is tension or anxiety between two people. Uh, and if I'm friends with both of those people then I may try to get into the middle of it and mediate. And so really what will end up happening is I'm arguing to one person for the other side and then arguing to the other person for the, you know, the opposite side. It's kind of hard to explain in words. No, that's good. But uh, You're caught in the middle. Yeah, I'm caught in the middle, and it's either arguing with both of them or sympathizing with both of them, hmm. which no matter what is always a problem. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's interesting you use the example that you pull yourself in because sometimes we can't handle it when people we love have a problem with each other and we invite ourselves in. Other times someone tries to pull us in. Anyone have an example of either of those? I do. Okay. Um, for sure, 
So last year I did have some drama with a lot of my friends, and they. Wait, you're a middle school girl, with drama? and you're saying that you had drama with friends? <laughs> <laughs> yes, middle school girls have drama. Shocker, um, but you know, it just um, I felt the need to totally help their friendship, although I they weren't pulling me into this. It, they were keeping me out of it as much as they could, but I was the one pulling myself in. Mm. so that I could feel at peace around them. Mm. Mm -hmm. So it seemed like to me I wasn't trying to help them as much as I was trying to help me and my friends with them. Yeah, their anxiety made you anxious. Yeah. So you went in, you think to help them, but you now think to make yourself feel better. Yeah, yeah. feel yeah. at peace. Wow. It's pretty good. I learned that lesson, like, I don't know, <laughs> not long ago. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I think it's, I think what's really sticking out to me in this conversation too is just sometimes we think other people are sucking us into things, but really we're bringing ourselves into it. Um, I'm struck that that's been the examples. Yeah. yeah. It's like showing up at a party you weren't invited to. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And you think everyone's glad to see you. Yes. And now you end up. Maybe they would have been just fine if you hadn't arrived. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and I, yeah I can relate to that. Oh, that's really good. I think for me, um, the approval, wanting the approval of others, wanting to know that everybody's okay with me, um, is what sucks me into triangulation, you know, or, or gets me into it. And I remember a huge point in my life where we were feeling conflict, you know, even this was years ago within our church family, and I don't like the feeling of conflict, so I'm wanting to go talk to people and make sure everybody's okay. And at a specific women's retreat, I even sensed, like, God saying, just go to bed. <laughs> Don't talk to another person, right? And I'm like, just one more. And it, it absolutely put me over to the edge to the point where one of the most powerful times I think that I've heard the voice of God was just God saying, look, um, you know, in this conflict, if that person is fine with me, me being God, and isn't okay with you, can you live with that? And me realizing that I sadly think that if everybody's okay with God, then they're also okay with me. <laughs> and that's not always the way it goes. And it's being okay with that. I'm a person who I'm like, mom, I can't stand conflict. And it's, for me, it's not like often it is me wanting to get in between and solve it myself. But um, it's not always like that for me. For me, more when it's someone's conflicted with me, I feel like I need to solve it right away because I also feel like um, I need people to be okay with me and I can't stand when people are upset with me because I hate doing things that hurt other people. That's really good. Yeah, one of the things that generates chronic anxiety is when you believe you need something you don't actually need. Yeah. And I think it's so powerful to be able to name. And I think that's what you're talking about. And, and I think the other challenge is when, when so often our solution to a problem is try harder. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if somebody's intentionally frosting you out and you can't handle it and you keep moving toward them, they're just going to have to run away further from you. Mm -hmm. And then you don't sleep. And, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I would love to keep chatting. This has been super fun, but Bryson has to get to work and we're out of time. So thank you guys for coming on the show. This actually wraps up season two. It's been a great season. We'll be back in September. We have guests. Let's see, Drew Dick is coming on the show. Dr. Russell Moore, Dr. Salter, Brenda Salter McNeil, uh, Darren Patrick and his wife Amy are joining us. Jeff Goins is joining us. So lots of great guests coming up. And um, yeah, we look forward to seeing everyone in September. This episode has been a production of Brendan Reed and Steve Cuss.